being gay, being homosexual, was against the law until uh, just before that. People could be sent to uh, jail, uh, arrested. Uh, the mindset of a lot of people still believed uh, that gay people were uh, the untouchables. They just seemed to be uh, considered pariahs and unwanted. And during that time, uh, there was a great deal of fear and confusion, and many of us heard from our relatives how sad they were that they would never see us in heaven. So in a way, the street was the only place to go. There was no place, and uh, middle-class gays were in the closet. They weren't going to help us. We were really on our own. I had heard about the Tenderloin was where the gay people hung out. And this is where the kids figured there was some safety in numbers. There was a place to make money, uh, get a cheap hotel room. Uh, and you did have some gay bars which were regularly busted. And every time there was election in San Francisco, the paddy wagons would go around and just round up everybody in gay bars. That's how people got elected. The first thing I remember being on Market Street in the Tenderloin is seeing, uh, I still think he was about 13, a young boy crying and bleeding and I rushed over to him and he said his ribs were broken and I said maybe we better get the police and he said the police did this to him and he said they regularly did it to him and I think that was the spark that eventually made me want to do Vanguard which is somehow I couldn't stand it. We got harassed quite a bit by the police in Compton. So a lot of times they would come in and just pick us up if we were eating for no reason and put us in jail for female impersonation. I had one policeman that hated me with a passion and every time he seen me he says, get in the paddy wagon. I said, I just had my hamburger. He says, eat it Monday when you get out. Many of the street people felt that they had nothing to lose. And so why not stand up for their rights? First there was picketing, and I remember we passed out flyers and asked for the youth to participate. We had well over 30 uh, kids. I was carrying one of the, the signs. Mine uh, said um, that we demand our rights. Another one would say drag queen de demands their rights. Another one said youth demand their rights. We weren't asking for much. Actually, we were asking for much less. We just didn't want to be harassed, killed, beaten up, bullied. We wanted less trouble and more uh, opportunities. We got tired of being harassed. We got tired of being made go into the men's room when we were dressed like women. We um, wanted our rights. I felt that it was liberation. It felt like gay liberation. At that point, it freed us to be ourselves, not to be not afraid to be ashamed. It was a whole new day. It felt totally different. It was like we had transcended a point. We'd reached uh, the top of the hill, and we're now coming down another side. And this led us to having dances, community events, uh, community dinners, which eventually turned into the Gay and Lesbian Center, where we had our own community center. There was the poverty program. There was Glide Methodist Church. It was the background of the peace and civil rights movement. And so us gay kids for a moment, I think, thought we were part of that. And, I th and looking back now, I realize that really that was the beginning. Okay, are we ready to roll? Okay, so, um, so Louise Durkin came into your office at the poverty program one afternoon. Uh, and that was your the beginnings of your contact. Yeah, first, with the first community. introduction to a transsexual. But whatever the cause, it still remains a devastating problem, resulting at times in self mutilation, suicide, insane asylums, and any other kind of horror you can imagine. I know you set up this group called COG, mm -hmm. um, and that later there was a group called the National Transsexual Counseling Unit. That was, well, how did yeah. that come about? Well, I met Reed Erickson and he became aware of my concern about what happened with transsexuals. Reed was in fact a conversion himself. He would pay the rent for me to open an office. The department had no problem about that as long as they didn't have to pay the rent. We would take two or three transsexuals basically to staff the office. 
and the transsexual does need money. Money for a decent place to live, money for living expenses, electrolysis, doctor's fees, medication, so on. And so I would call up and I would say, hey now, look, you asked for Mary Jane Brown to come in and see you at nine o'clock. Now, let me tell you something. Mary Jane Brown will need at least three or four hours to get made up for that meeting with you. Now, if you're going to call in my girls, will you please set afternoon appointments for them so that they can get prepared for you the way that they want to be? Because that's important, that they can show you themselves. The same thing from a, a woman going to, to a male. Uh, you have the same problems, except I have to be accepted by the male population. And uh, sometimes this is very difficult. I wanted this to happen, to be able to reach out to the community, to offer transsexuals a place where they felt it was safe to come, and yet to provide education for people about what this was all about. I read everything I could get my hands on on this subject and about homosexuality. Uh, I began to understand the people a lot better.